My name is Dalton Townsend, and I'm in Kingsport, Tennessee today, August 10, 2001, to interview Mr. M. Lacey West. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Would you give us your full name, please? Martin Lacey West. Lacey, uh, I've always wanted to take your deposition, uh, but I, I guess this will have to suffice. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> uh, would you give us uh, when and where you were born? Well, I was born in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1927. I understand that you've uh, lived most of your life in Kingsport. That's right. Why was it that uh, you were born in Raleigh? Well, uh, Dad was at the University of North Carolina, and Mama was working at Cannon Mills as a secretary, and just that's just the way things turned out. And then Dad took a job in Kingsport and came over here when I was two years old. Was your go ahead? Been here ever since. Your father uh, did he graduate from uh, University of North Carolina? Yes, he did. He's an engineer. Uh, where was he from originally? Well, he was from Philadelphia and then Winston-Salem. My, my grandfather was a physician practicing in Winston-Salem. And then he moved to Fayetteville and then back to North Carolina and then came over here and liked what he saw and raised his family here. Uh, how old were you when, when your family moved to the Kingsport area? I was two years old. Uh, you. Uh, uh, where'd you go to school over here? Well, I went to Washington School, Robert E. Lee, and Dobbins Bennett, which is still here, and uh, uh, left here and went to Alabama. We'll, we'll get to college in just All a right. moment. Um, okay. Uh, your, uh, your father, uh, what did he do uh, when, after he moved over here? Well, he went to work for the city of Kingsport. Uh, as an engineer and uh, had control of the waterworks. They had a new water plant here. And uh, Mama uh, raised a family. And uh, I spent uh, the summers until I was about 15 years old on the farm in North Carolina where Mama came from. And probably the best years of my life as far as having a good time, working hard, and knowing what the rear end of a mule looked like. <laughs> How long did your father work uh, for the city? Stayed the city until he was 70. And then he uh, retired and went back to work at another plant. And then he got up one morning and called me. He said, Lacey, I, I've retired. I've forgotten that I'd retired. I'm quitting this job. Come by to see me. <laughs> and so that's the way his career ended. And he loved his church, and he wanted to be active in the church, more active than he was. And so he finally hung it up. Did you have uh, brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a brother and a sister. If I, I may tell you a little bit about my brother right. and my sister. My sister is now deceased. She went to Carson Newman and then went to work at Eastman as a chemist. And my brother is still alive down in Florida. He volunteered for the Marine Corps, uh, achieved the rank of sergeant. Then he went to Korea. He was shot twice, reported killed in action twice, and uh, was heavily uh, decorated. Came back and stayed in the Marines for a while. Then he went to Alabama to the School of Aeronautics and went to work at uh, Pratt Whitney in Florida and now retired raising peacocks. What's his name? James, Jimmy. And what was your sister's name? Mary, Mary Elizabeth. Uh, when you uh, uh, went to Dobbins Bennett, uh, what were your interests uh, in school? Well, <laughs> well, mainly sports. I wasn't too interested in school as school, but uh, yeah, mainly sports. I was there. Uh, you may have noticed that Bobby Cyphers, a great athlete we had at Dobbins Bennett, was just 
ending his career at Dobbins Bennett when I went in as a freshman. And so I got to watch him through the years as he set one record after another. Uh, that kind of inspired me. And I just had a good time on the playing field. Now, I understand that you were a good football player, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Did you participate in other sports activities? Oh, well, yeah. I uh, Basketball, played a little bit of baseball. Didn't particularly like baseball. Uh, track, I, I uh, had a pretty good career in track. I was lucky. I, uh, it just came naturally to me. And, you know, if uh, people like horses, a horse can run, he's going to win. If he can't run, there's nothing you can do to help him. So I can run. And uh, what, what position did you play uh, in high school? Well, I played running back in high school, same position later on in college. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I understand that uh, as a result of your uh, abilities as a running back, you were awarded a football scholarship to Alabama. Well, they asked me to come down, and I went down, and, and, and I think they said, try it out, and I did, and they kept me. Okay. So <laughs> that's the way that works. How many years did you play uh, football at Alabama? I played one full year and started out the next year, but I'd been injured in service and couldn't couldn't go. Uh, I had a uh, had a football injury in service. I didn't. I'm not a war hero. <laughs> I just got hurt playing football and got discharged. Now, uh, who was your coach while you played uh, football at Alabama? Uh, he was the same coach uh, uh, that coached the the bear. And uh, he's now dead, Frank Thomas. Uh, he's, he's the coach that had uh, more wins over General at UT than the General had over him. So uh, he was a good fellow. For those uh, uh, who are listening who might not know, uh, uh, who was the Bear? Oh, Bear Bryant. I thought everybody knew who Bear Bryant was. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Uh, who uh, were some of your, your teammates at Alabama who uh, were most successful on the field? Well, by far the most successful man at Alabama was our quarterback, Harry Gilmer. Uh, he was a great passing quarterback. Uh, Vaughn Matcher was there. He was a, a center, All-American center. Vaughn went on to, I believe it's University of Florida. Uh, to become athletic director. Uh, those are the two main standouts that I, that I, that I remember. Have you uh, maintained uh, relationships with them or did you after college? No, no, we went separate ways. I remember Harry went to, he coached to the Detroit Lions for a while and then I, I kept up, I heard about Vaughn and kind of kept up with him. It's a funny thing, Tuscaloosa is not really adjacent to anything much less Kingsport, so uh, no reason to to keep up with them except for uh, old time's sake, so I didn't. While uh, at Alabama, uh, and while you were playing ball, did you ever play against Tennessee? Yes, I did. How many times? One time. And uh, what year was that? That was in 1944. What was the score? Nothing to nothing. <laughs> that was an exceptional game. How much did you play in that game? Not very much. Uh, just enough to get knocked around. Tennessee could lay it on you. <laughs> you remember any Tennessee players uh, who uh, participated in that game? No, I don't. I really don't. Uh, there was a fellow out of uh, Elizabethan, but I can't remember his name. I played against him in high school. Manning. John Manning. That was his name. Uh, he was a great player out of Elizabethan. He went to UT and I went to Alabama. Now you were, as I understand it, uh, at Alabama, uh, uh, what, 43 to 44, 45? No, 44 to 45, I believe it was. Right. Uh, and uh, after uh, you were injured, uh, did, you, uh, did you stay on at Alabama or did you well, leave? Well, the service, I, I volunteered for the Navy. Okay. And uh, while I was in the Navy, I was fortunate enough to, to be uh, uh, drafted, so to speak, on the football team out at uh, Shoemaker, California. 
they had moved what's known as the Bainbridge 11 from the Bainbridge training station and had uh, moved us from Great Lakes and combined us into the Shoemaker team. And uh, they uh, drafted most college players. I don't know of a single high school player that we had. But we had folks like uh, uh, Choo Choo Justice. I ran second string behind Choo Choo on that team. And uh, another fellow that uh, you've seen many, many times, James Garner, the movie actor. Uh, he was on that team. And uh, I might tell you that he doesn't act. That's just the way he is. Uh, he kept us all in stitches there on the field and in the shower afterwards. And uh, kind of miss him. So uh, it was a team that was made up of some pretty good people. And uh, it was a team that the press said was the only team in the country that could have beaten Army. That's when they had Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. But uh, before we actually got into the formal season, I got hurt, believe it or not, covering a pass play with Justice. He uh, faked me, and uh, I went the wrong way, and he went the right way, and I ended up in the hospital with a torn knee. And uh, Navy, the war was over. And they didn't need me, and <laughs> they sent me home, thank goodness. A lot of people don't know uh, uh, in the modern times, but uh, back then, uh, as I understand it, football, I mean, the, the military had football teams. Right. Uh, Absolutely. In fact, the general at UT coached one in Europe, as I remember correctly. And uh, they, were, they were highly competitive. They had the best talent in the country. We had two or three pros whose name I don't remember now playing for that team at Shoemaker. And there's no reason why they sh shouldn't uh, be rated high. Choo Choo Justice, uh, where did he play ball in college? Uh, Choo Choo played at the uh, University of North Carolina. But I might add an addendum to that. Choo Choo was raised over at Asheville, North Carolina. And when I was a sophomore in high school, I played on the Dobbins Bennett team that Choo Choo literally ran over. So I had remembered him and had known him for some time. And uh, we had a ride after that game here in Kingsport, and uh, haven't played him since. So <laughs> I recall he played against Tennessee uh, on yes, more than one occasion. Yes, he did. Choo Choo was. Uh, uh, was not very fast, but he had the ability to be gone out of, out of your hands before you turned around. I understand he's over to Greensboro, North Carolina now. When were uh, you discharged from the Navy? Discharged in August, as well as I recall. Right after the Hiroshima. Now, after your discharge, uh, did you did you have an opportunity to go back to Alabama? Tried to tried to to to, to go, and a knee wouldn't hold. So uh, I didn't want to stay down there and and not play ball. Uh, they didn't cancel my scholarship or anything like that. But so I came back home and went to King College, Presbyterian School here at Kingsport. And of course, Dad was pretty influential in getting me to go there. I was on the GI Bill. I could have gone anywhere. So I went back to King College. Right. Did you ever graduate from uh, King College? No, I never graduated from any college. I went ahead and took uh, courses at the University of Tennessee. As a matter of fact, uh, extension courses. As a matter of fact, Burkett McInturf, lawyer in Kingsport, taught me business law uh, and, and some of these extension courses. And when I uh, got through with that, why well, I signed up with uh, LaSalle Extension University and went through about three years of study with them. They had regular law books. We had about 12 or 14 of those. And uh, I worked at the newspaper at night. I was uh, went to work as a sportsman and then also as a reporter and then also as a uh, managing editor there for a while. And since I worked at night, I, it was a good time to study in the day. So I studied uh, law with LaSalle. Uh, I had the help of a lot of lawyers in this town. 
I remember uh, Bill Todd was very helpful. Bill would stop me on the street and ask me legal questions <laughs> and say, well, you, you might make it, <laughs> you know. And I remember his brother, Rucker Todd, uh, took me through a review course of what we call negotiable instruments back in those days. And I wasn't any good at all at that. So uh, Penn Smith and Davis allowed me to use the library and gave me a few little projects just to, I guess, see how I was doing. Howard Wilson was another one that uh, was very helpful. Judge Witt was another one that was very helpful. I just received encouragement from all of those folks. I was, I was lucky. Uh, did you ever attend a, a, a traditional law school? No, sir. No, uh, sir. Did you? Did First what? time I was ever in law school was when I took the bar exam. <laughs> uh, my dad used to use the term, uh, uh, he read the law. Yes, sir. Is that more or less what you did? Yes, sir. And to this day, I can go to a seminar, and I don't get as much out of listening. But if you let me read it, I get a lot more out of it. I think it's from those old days sitting at a card table and going through these, these books. I look for some of them. I, 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 another man here in town took the same course and got through with it, brought his books, and I can't find any of them, so I don't know. But Gene Hunter, who was really the senior member of Penn Hunter, Smith & Davis, gave me my final exam under lock and key, and he read that exam, and he told me, he said, Lacey, I couldn't pass this right now. You know? Yep. And I, I was glad that I asked him to supervise that because I had in mind asking for a job. <laughs> Did you have any uh, family uh, members who had been in the law? Uh, no, sir. What, what sparked your interest in uh, becoming a lawyer? Well, uh, working as a uh, police uh, reporter, uh, I uh, got exposed to a lot of things that happened at night. And then I would try to follow up in the daytime if I was particularly interested in the cases. And uh, saw lawyers in, in action. Uh, had a good taste of, of the process. Uh, wanted to improve myself financially if I could. And uh, I, an interesting thing, I was told about LaSalle by uh, an accountant who was auditing the books at the newspaper. And as a result of that, I inquired. I didn't have the money to, to go to law school. And then I inquired of uh, the bar folks as to what was necessary to take the bar. And so that's how it happened. Now, uh, at some point, uh, you had to pass the bar. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, where did you take the bar? Took the bar in Knoxville, Tennessee. Interesting story there. <laughs> How naive I was. I hitchhiked to Knoxville with a typewriter. <laughs> Thinking that you could, you know, use that in that. And that's the way I'd learned to think, working at newspaper. And uh, I got a ride with a little girl in a convertible. And uh, she was going to Birmingham, and she almost talked me into going on down to Birmingham. And <laughs> I decided I better not. Anyway, I walked into the to the uh, exam that law school can that typewriter, and it was spotted by a fellow from Chattanooga. I've forgotten his name. One of the bar examiners immediately, and he said, "You, you either get out or you get the typewriter out." So I got the typewriter out, but uh, that was my introduction to law school. Uh -huh. uh, when did you uh, pass the bar? In in March of fifty one. And uh, licensed. Uh, and licensed in March. Yeah. Uh -huh. Where were you sworn in? Uh, wasn't sworn in for several years because you didn't have to be. Uh, I was finally sworn in several years later before the United before the uh, Supreme Court at Knoxville. No, no, at Nashville, I believe. One or the other. If my calculations are correct, then you've been practicing uh, a little over 50 years. Right. Long time. But a fun time. He, uh, I don't think you mentioned uh, the name a moment ago. Uh, what was the name of the newspaper where you worked? Kingsport Times News. Still here, still operating. <clears throat>
Uh, where did you first practice law? Kingsport. And with, by yourself or with no, some? No, Hunter, Smith and Davis. They gave me a job. Okay. And you were associate there uh, how many years? Oh, about five, five and a half years. Uh, uh, those, those people uh, gave me an opportunity, uh, gave me an education, worked the devil out of me, but they, they did me proud, as they say. They were good to me. That firm still uh, exists, of yes. course. Oh, yes, indeed it does. It's a very prominent, well-respected firm in this oh, area. Oh, yes. I, I know uh, you're talking about a history of the law here. Uh, I think it'd be proper for me to refer to some of these lawyers that I did compete against and have continued to compete against through the years. Uh, another thing that might be of interest to you is that Steve Rose, my partner, and I uh, come from the same cloth, so to speak. Steve's daddy worked for the city, and he's a native, and he went to Dobbins Bennett, and he played football, and he received his initial training at Penn Hunter Smith and Davis, <coughs> under the same lawyers that I trained under, and he's one heck of a trial lawyer, as you know. I do know that. And uh, so he and I think a lot alike. We've had one argument. In the 19 years, I guess he's been here, it was over the color of the wall in the conference room, right. <laughs> and, that, and that was it. I remember one time I was in Atlanta and I called back and asked to, to speak to Steve, and they said, "Well, he's not here." And I said, "Where is he?" And they said, "He's in Atlanta." So that's how closely we keep up, keep up with each other. Back to uh, when you were an associate with the pen. Uh, firm, Hunter Smith firm. Right. Uh, what was your starting salary? You remember? <laughs> yes, I remember. I uh, started at what you can make, young man, on your own. And the first year, I made ninety dollars on my own. And that was bad in a way, but it wasn't bad because I kept my night job at the newspaper. The publisher of the newspaper helped me very much. So I kept my income going and did that for about a year and a half or two years. And then the firm put me on a salary, uh, which was $200 a month, and I was appointed city judge, and that made paid me $200 a month. So actually, I got a little raise. How and long I, were you? Go ahead. How long were you city judge? Four years. Now, by this time, did you have a uh, family? Oh, yes. I had three children. Okay. And uh, yeah. so I understand what you're telling us. You basically had three jobs. Uh, Worked pretty hard, but it didn't hurt me. Practicing law and uh, working the newspaper yeah. at night and yeah. the city judge. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. Uh, your children, uh, uh, what do you have, boys? Or well, I, I have three, uh, three children. Uh, my son, Tommy, is a lawyer in Daytona Beach. Uh, he went, as I may have told you earlier, he went down to uh, Cumberland Law School. Uh, my daughter, uh, Marilyn, is in Columbia, Tennessee. She uh, works as a uh, procurer of office talent. And my other daughter is in Roanoke, and she works with the Y, YMCA. And uh, they're all very happy. As a matter of fact, I have a great-grandchild. Uh, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. How many grandchildren do you have? I have four. Four grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Your lawyer son, uh, uh, did he ever practice with you? Yes, he did, and we found out that that was a hard thing to do. <laughs> uh, Tommy is very aggressive. I, I think sometimes I'm aggressive. And Tommy did not like to report to insurance companies. He just then I've done the work, why should I tell him about it? Well, you've got to tell him about it, Tommy. But anyway, he, he liked the water, he liked boats, and uh, one day he said, I'm going to go to Florida. And I, I said, well, you haven't passed the bar in Florida. Well, I'm going to take it, pass it. And I thought, uh-huh. Oh, boy, that's a big man talking. Well, he took it, and he did pass it. And then I, last I saw was the taillights going down the road. <laughs> So, 
What kind of lawyer, what kind of law does he practice? He's a plaintiff's lawyer. Died in the wool, plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, has a good practice. Enjoys life. Those people in Florida, I don't believe they work nearly as hard as we Tennesseans do. But uh, it's whatever makes you happy. You know, you've been accused of not reporting yourself. You know that, don't well, you? Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I guess it's kind of catching. <laughs> I remember one time, <coughs> it's a little bit off off the beam, but I want to tell you about it. Fireman's Fund, they were so glad to get a letter from me. They said that they wrote back immediately and said, while your pen is still hot, send us a bill. So I did and came back from Homer Ayers. He's a good friend of mine. He's a lawyer now. Uh, said, I can't get only about $2,500 out of this bill. I think you're a little bit too high. I said, resubmit it. And I wrote back that I wasn't too high, that I had uh, spent a lot of potty time on his bill. <laughs> Well, back came the check wrapped in toilet paper. So. <laughs> <laughs> we had a good relationship through the years. Uh, while at uh, uh, Hunter, I'm Penn Hunter, uh, who, uh, did you have a mentor there, so to speak? Or? Yes, I uh, had two. Started out with uh, Gene Hunter, who was doing mainly corporate and, and labor law work, which I did not like. Did not like it at all, and I told him so. And he moved me to uh, Ben Davis's office, who was a tort lawyer, litigator. And uh, I just ate that up. I thoroughly enjoyed that. That's that was my cup of tea. And uh, Steve Rose went much the same route when he was there. So uh, I think that's one of the reasons we get along so well. Why do you uh, think you gravitated toward the? trial uh, toward trial work? It was not boring. I found that in reading uh, labor law reports you read on one page that something was true and turn the page over and you see the alternative is true. I never, I never get, did feel like I had real hold of it, a real, real grasp of it. It was administrative law which is vague as you know uh, and I just didn't like it. And in fact, I think I, if I had to stayed there, I would have gone back to the newspaper. I believe I would have. You recall yeah. your first trial? Mm. Yep. <laughs> Lost it. What kind of case was it? It was an automobile case. I was at General Sessions Court. I didn't last five minutes. Remember that? Way? I, as a matter of fact, uh, Snapper, I better explain that word Snapper. <laughs> I tried 16 straight cases and lost every one of them. And I was convinced that I should not be a lawyer. And uh, took a little doing on part of Ben Davis and Jack Smith to convince me that I should. And I'm glad that they did. Uh, they, they convinced me that it wasn't what I was doing or not doing, it was just the cases. But now I better talk about why I called you Snapper. <laughs> I was afraid we were going to get to this. But you going to do what? I was afraid we were going to get to that. Yeah, you're going to get to it in a hurry. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that I find uh, most rewarding is the associations that we have with other lawyers as we don't go down this trail of practicing law. You know, a, a doctor fights bugs. Lawyers fight each other. So you better know your adversary. And I got to know you real well in a real sizable products liability case that involved some of the best lawyers in this country. And you were doing a bang up job on, on witnesses, tearing them apart, much to my uh, dismay. And I couldn't seem to get hold of you either. <laughs> so uh, you were very incisive in your cross examination. You still are today. We've had some more since that time. And I laid the word snapper on you. And under, unlike some other lawyers who I have uh, laid nicknames on, this, this seemed to speed you up and didn't slow you down a bit. But I'm happy to say that that is a nickname that has stuck. And uh, when I say how Snapper Towns are doing, they know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> You're one of the best that I have ever seen in yeah. your cross-examination and your preparation of cases. And you know something? 
I learn from you. I learn from you. That's what you have to do in this business. You have to learn from your adversaries. Well, I thank you for those words. Uh, well, uh, they're very truthful words. But, uh, we're here to talk about a, a great lawyer. Uh, I'm asking questions. Well, uh, at some point you you left Penn Penn Hunter. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, that was about what 1956. Yes. Uh, what did you do after leaving? Uh, well, I, uh, I left Penn Hunter to accept an appointment as the district attorney general for the uh, counties of Greene and Sullivan and Hamlin and Hawkins. Uh, the district attorney that had that job was elevated to the judgeship. And I thought it was time for me to move on. And uh, two very fine men here in Kingsport intervened because I was not political. I've never been political. And the governor appointed me to the unexpired term, which is only about a year and a half somewhere in that, of Conway Smith's job. As I said, I thought it was time to move on, and I did. Now, back then, uh, unlike some district attorney generals now, did, did, the, did the general actually try cases? You better believe it. I was the only one for four counties. I didn't have an assistant. And so <laughs> that kept you on the road and kept you in front of a jury. And I think really... Uh, uh, that made me, if anything, did. I, I gather you tried a lot of criminal lot of cases. cases. A lot of cases. And, and in this day and time, if it's possible for students to come out of law school to go to work in a district attorney's office where they'll be in, on the firing line in front of a jury, they better do it. Would you, how would you describe uh, yourself as a prosecutor? Uh, somewhat unrelenting. And that, that, that got me in trouble, which I can tell you about later. I, I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember any, uh, any cases that uh, stick out in your mind while you were prosecuting? Oh, yes. Yes, there were some that... Uh, you see, you can't, you can't think of these convictions as being a trophy. They're human beings. And... Uh, and, and, and getting ready for this interview, I tried to think back. And yes, there are several cases. There's a case that I had here involving uh, uh, a prisoner who's still on death row. So I won't mention his name. Uh, Mr. McInturf represented him and did a beautiful job. He was being prosecuted for being an habitual criminal. Uh, he escaped. This has all the elements of a story. He escaped. He was caught again. And he wanted to be sent to a neighboring state where he had a friendly folks. And I refused to do so and kept him here. Uh, a caretaker that was caring for him when he was shot after he was apprehended the first time fell in love with him and helped him escape. So the story was all over the newspaper for a long, long time. And uh, it's only for that reason that I might say that uh, that's one of the uh, bigger cases, if you want to use that term, that I tried. Uh, Mr. McIntosh did a beautiful job in that case. And in fact, Mac is known as the criminal lawyer here, along with uh, uh, my friend uh, Culbertson who's started doing criminal work and, and is an excellent attorney. That's Wayne? Wayne, okay. right. Absolutely. Uh, you indicated you were completing a term, what, of a year and a half? Yeah, something like that. I forgot exactly what it was. Did you decide to run again? No, I did not. You want to tell us why you didn't? Well, yes, I'll, I'll be glad to. I was trying a case in a neighboring county involving an armed robbery of a gentleman in his home, a very wealthy gentleman, known by everybody in the county. Uh, we developed that the defendant had been convicted of a couple of other felonies. 
We didn't have anything but uh, circ circumstantial evidence. We tried the case for three or four days. I was convinced that he was guilty. I prosecuted him hard. Jury came back 11 to 1, locked up. Which way, if you know? In favor of the state. One man, one man stopped that conviction. So we reset it for trial. And before it could be tried again, we discovered that the man was not guilty and found the man who was. Now that had a well nigh paralyzing effect upon me to think that uh, I could have made such a mistake. Uh, this man took the, he took the witness stand. That's unusual, as you know, in criminal cases and denied that he had done this. And uh, I referred to several states, where were you in such and such time, and everybody knew there was a big pen there. Then I'd refer to another state, and everybody knew that there was a big penitentiary there. And the jury picked up on the fact that he had been, in, and, uh, and, they, and they got away with it. And I thought to myself, if I use that talent or ability, as it were, to convict an innocent person, I don't think I'd ever get over it. So I thought that in view of the fact that I almost had done that, that the best thing for me to do is to get out of the game, go back to where you couldn't hurt somebody. And also, another element entered into it, <clears throat> Judge John R. Todd, who was our circuit judge then and a favorite character, and you remember him, I'm sure called me to his office one day and he said, General, if you think you're going to educate those three children, you better get out of office. You ain't going to make it there. <laughs> and those are pretty strong words, you know. But all of that together <clears throat> convinced me that I was in the wrong end of it. And so I did not run again, although I was unopposed. I'm proud of that fact. Told that they would not oppose me. And uh, then we got Buck quit from Kingsport to run and he was he was elected and then from there he went on to the circuit bench. Have you ever practiced criminal law uh, since that time? I haven't tried a case since that day. And that would have been what 1956 or 7? 57 I guess. I haven't tried a case since that day. Don't want to. Uh, what what did you do after uh, uh, leaving? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, had, I had walked out on a good job, and uh, uh, I had left Penn Hunter. So uh, I opened my own office by myself. And luckily, uh, some of the insurance companies that I had represented when I was at Penn Hunter uh, came with me. Uh, not because they were dissatisfied particularly, but, you know, they knew me. So I had a pretty good practice going there, and then uh, I teamed up with Joe Fuller, who was an adjuster, and uh, he knew some insurance people. And so between us, we had a pretty good practice going here in, in Kingsport as defense lawyers. Let me digress just a moment. While you were the uh, district attorney for uh, four or five years, how many cases do you think you tried as a prosecutor, just off the top of your head? It would be off the top of my head. I think I processed close to 700,000 processed. I mean, they weren't all tried. Uh, I, I, it would simply be a wild guess. I didn't uh, didn't keep any record. Uh, they, uh, you know, back in that day and time, different from now, you had a lot of folks in there Domestic violence was the thing that got most people in trouble, you know? And a lot of those folks, they'd kiss and make up, and they didn't belong in the penitentiary. They didn't even belong in the county jail for more than 30 days, maybe. So we got rid of a lot of them that way. And uh, I don't know how they're doing it now, but 
And now it seems like we got more serious things going, but back at that day and time, do you know that in one corner of the courtroom at Greene County, we had a cell? And we'd put these defendants in that cell in their striped suits, waited for their case to be called. The constitutional rights <laughs> got violated a lot of times. So uh, simply, I think that the, the prisoners were not uh, did not feel as free to challenge as they do now. And, 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 and while I'm there, may I digress a little bit? Yes. Uh, my wife, Julia, is a lawyer. And <clears throat> we've been married some 42 years. And uh, she's been a lawyer now for about 10 or, 10 or 12 years. And she specializes in civil rights work, representing uh, TML, Tennessee Municipal League. And she's well familiar with the constitutional requirements, and she cringes sometimes at some of the things that happen, not because they result in any particular harm, but because they are not constitutional. And uh, she has been very helpful uh, in that regard in this office to me and to the firm, and also Bless her heart, she does a lot of, uh, I'm not too good at looking up the law anymore. They've got all these machines that you have to tip tap on. You know? <laughs> so she does that for me. And, and, and we've got a team going here that, uh, along with Steve Rose, and I have a, I have a, a paralegal, Cammie McDavid, who uh, she can't quit because she's related to us, and I can't fire her because she's related to us. But everybody in town wants to hire, including Bill Gamble, every chance he gets. So we all work together as a team, and uh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate not to have to try criminal cases. I'm fortunate being able to try the type of cases that I do try because of that great help. I'm going to talk about uh, you and Julia some more later on or right. ask you about her, but uh, since we've mentioned her name, would tell us her full name. Uh, Julia Cyphers West. Uh, now, back to your first uh, law firm that you ran, so right. to speak, you and Joe Fuller. Right. It's the late Joe Fuller. Late Joe Fuller. When, when did Joe pass away? Uh, oh, my goodness, it's been five or six years. Yes, at least that long, yeah. Uh, Heart problems. He was a, a trustee of the University of Tennessee, I think. Yes, that's right. And he loved that job, and he deserved it. In fact, uh, they named it. Bridge down here for him. I saw that. Yeah, Joseph O. Fuller Bridge, yeah. How did you and he uh, get along in your... Not well at all. <laughs> Not well at all. Okay. But we respected each other, and uh, uh, Joe was a very aggressive fellow, too, and sometimes we didn't uh, exactly, you know, meet. But he was, uh, he, he, in, the, uh, in the basic sense, he was a friend. Uh, I miss him. He, uh, he got that job at the University of Tennessee, and I guess that was the crowning uh, glory of his life. He lived for it. And, uh, but he was a fine trial lawyer, too. He, uh, these judges, you talk to these judges around here, uh, Roger Thayer, uh, Judge Ladd, uh, people that, uh, as you know, are competent, uh, had a lot of respect for Joe. I had a few cases against him myself. Well, yes, you did. So I'm sure that you feel the same way. It's, it's uh, he wasn't, uh, he was not able to serve in, uh, as a trustee very long. That's he, right. That's exactly right. He had surgery, uh, heart surgery, and uh, had a, a few problems, as I understand it, and went to see his doctor about three days before he passed on. And. Uh, We've had, had that happen to several good lawyers here. Bill Hawkins, you remember Bill, you had cases against him. Unfortunately. Yeah, he, uh, he, he was a good one. He was. So uh, those things happen. Uh, how long did you and, and, and Mr. Fuller practice together? Oh, I think five or six years. 
Oh, wait. I, Go ahead, excuse me. I, I, I think he thought it was too long sometimes, and so did I. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it was about that period of time. Were you still doing mostly insurance defense work? Oh yeah, right, right. And uh, he went out and formed a partnership with Brantley Blue, who was a good friend of mine, and Brantley is now deceased. And he later became the Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, he, he, he's gone now, too. Being a defense lawyer back in those days, uh, I assume that you tried a lot of jury cases. Yes, sir. I miss them. <laughs> I declare I miss them. And I'm, I'm sure uh, you do, too. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit okay. later on, too. All right. Okay. Uh, after you and uh, Joe uh, decided to break up, so to speak, uh, did you practice on your own or as, as have your own firm for a Well, years? I had my own firm, but I also had uh, <clears throat> some, some good associates. Uh, you want to name some I, of them? I made a list here because there were an awful lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one that has achieved the most, if anybody has, uh, uh, as, as my associate is, is a judge, John Byers. You know John. Then what kind of, for those who are listening, yeah. what kind of criminal uh, judge was he? Or is he? Uh, well, he was a criminal judge here, and now he is the, in the Court of Criminal Appeals, but I think he's taken uh, seniority status. Uh -huh. But he was, he's a real fine fellow, and we were very good friends and still are to this day. But others that we had was Bobby Ray Tate. Bobby had an unfortunate end. And uh, we simply say that he was a fine lawyer. I, I remember when I hired him, he came into the office. He'd been a star football player at Dobbins Bennett, and I knew who he was uh, by his name. And uh, finally we got through the interview, and I said, uh, Bobby Ray, <coughs> what, makes, what makes you want to come to work for me? He looked at me and he said, tell you the truth, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to work for you. By the time Joe Worley gets back and rules on my application, I'll starve to death. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the way he came into my firm, and he and I became good friends, and I was fortunate enough to, to preach his eulogy after his death. And I understand it was a, a fine eulogy. Well, thank you, sir. I, I meant it to be. I tried to. Whatever I said was the way I felt. But then I had others that uh, still around, Danny Miner and Carl Eilers, and Dave Blankenship, Don Sparrell, he's over at Johnson City, Charlton Duvall, made quite a name for himself, suing the city here. Art Knight, he's back down at Knoxville now, you probably know Art. And uh, I think I mentioned, and then Ed Harvey who went back to Memphis, so uh, I've had some good folks helping me on the way. I wasn't entirely by myself. So, uh, and some of them I think would come back. I, I remember I said, Charlton, when are you gonna come back? Help me. He said, Well, I'll come back, Lacey, and and help you, but I I won't work for you. I'll work with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we had some good relationships in those days. Okay. Um. You uh, uh, did you were your partner with anyone after that? No. Uh, uh, yes, I was. Yes, I remember. Walt Waddy came in, and uh, uh, we were we were partnered, but that didn't last long. Walt uh, went back to church. He's preaching now. Uh, then I was back on my own again. Okay. Before we go on, Lacey, we're going to take a. A break for a few minutes. All right. And come back and talk Appreciate about it. your career some more. I'm afraid I've got the sniffles here. <laughs> okay. Lacey, uh, before we broke, uh, I think uh, we, uh, I'm not sure we'd mentioned that you were a partner with Walt Waddy for yeah, what, one yeah, year. Yeah. No, not quite in a year. A year? Yeah. And that would have been, what, about 1973 or thereabouts? About that would be close okay. enough, yes. Uh, and 
And after that, uh, uh, did you practice uh, on your own or with associates uh, until 1982? Yes. Yeah. And I think you felt <coughs> that uh, Steve Rose has been with you since that time. Yeah, Steve actually saved my uh, career, really, because I was overworked. I couldn't handle it all. I was getting ready to turn loose some pretty good companies, and he walked in. Uh, he's uh, been a good addition to your firm. And your My friend, he has been an excellent lawyer. He has been a friend. Uh, I don't know what I could do without him. He's, uh, as you know, highly respected. He covers a lot of ground. He made it possible for uh, Julia to go back to law school in that he helped me meet a hard schedule. He's just been as good a friend as a man that could want. I said we're going to talk about Julia a little more. All right. Uh, you and Be he, glad you to and do she that. Uh, uh, were married when? Well, it's been 42 years. I mean, do your math. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, 1959? 59? How many I, years is that? Uh, a lot of years. That's 42 years. She's a tolerant yeah. woman. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, I know y'all have had a wonderful relationship because I've, I've known we you both have. for, uh, I guess, 25 years. Yes, right? you have. Yes, you have. We, you, 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 you know about us, and you've been with us on some of our happiest times, and it's been a lot to us. Now she worked when, when I first met you, um, both of you, or her. Uh, yeah. uh, I'd known you before. Yeah. Uh, she was working in your law office, if I right, recall, right. Uh, but was not a lawyer. No, she wasn't. And it, if I recall, sometime uh, a few years back, uh, you let me know that she was going to, to law school. Right. She, she went to law school long after she'd gotten out of uh, East Tennessee State. <clears throat> she had a master's in English and a B.S. in English or a B.A. in English. Perfect to send you to law school. But she didn't go for a number of years. When did she uh, uh, enroll in law school? She went in 1988. Uh, and it, by that time, it was pretty difficult to uh, be uh, oh, to boy. gain admission to yeah, the University of Tennessee. <laughs> I tell you what, we we got uh, the letter came to our, our home or to our mother's home while we were in Lexington, and uh, she called. And the mother said, you've got a letter here from the University of Tennessee. And Judy said, open it up. And it, and it was the magic letter. And it pleased us mightily that uh, we were lucky. And she, uh, how long did it take her to uh, uh, finish her? Uh... She finished it in three and a half years. She went to, I say three and a half, she went during the summertime, took some extra courses or whatever they do down there. And during that period, uh, did you continue uh, your, your full-time practice here? Oh, at yeah. yeah that, that's where Steve came in. I, uh, we bought an apartment in Knoxville up on the ridge that overlooks the football field there. Cherokee Bluffs? Cherokee Bluffs. Right. Had, a, had a vice chairman or vice president of Eastman, I mean of, uh, of University of Tennessee as a neighbor. We had some good neighbors. And... Uh, Beautiful spot up there. I rode all over Knoxville before we selected it. But uh, if you ha have to go away to law school, be sure you just have a good, firm bed and a big kitchen. You'll be all right. How did you, uh, while she was a student in school, uh, uh, did you see her on weekends, or, 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 or how did that work? No, never missed a day. I'd, I'd come up here in the morning, and do my work, go back in the afternoon, get up the next morning, and come again. It was labor of love, and uh, worked fine. It didn't uh, wasn't nearly as tiring as it may appear to be. Uh, I got I tell you, as you know, the problem with the practice of law is you don't get enough time to really think. And it got to be, in the morning particularly, I looked forward to coming up here, that I'd have time to kind of put things in order. So uh, it was rough on the tires and the gas, 
but uh, really not too bad. I, I'm used to hard work. I've worked hard all my life just like you. So it worked out pretty well. I guess you were putting 50,000 miles a year at least. Uh, well, I don't recall the mileage, but it was way up there. <laughs> it would be about 1,000 miles a week Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. just during the week. Right. I never missed a trial. Uh, there again, I remember one time the judges helped me. They realized what I was doing. One time I stopped at McDonald's on the outskirts of Knoxville and to get something to eat early in the morning going to federal court. Came back and turned on the switch and nothing. I mean nothing. <laughs> and then I knew that I was in trouble. And I went in there I called the, the, uh, the magistrate. He said, well, Lacey, I'll discharge this jury until noon. You get here when you can. Now, that was, I can remember when they had a judge down there would have fined me. And you do too. <laughs> uh, I think I know who, of yeah. whom you're speaking. Yes, of. I think I do too. So I've gotten a lot of help along the way, and uh, uh, I haven't forgotten them. I sure haven't. What would y'all do on weekends? Uh, I know she still had to do some studying, but... Well, she uh, did do study, and uh, on Saturday, uh, we had some horses. She, she's a horsewoman, and, and we, I love horses. We had some horses down there, and she likes to ride. Saturday morning, we'd try to sneak over to the barn that was at Maryville. And then the rest of the time, it was work for her. Uh, the, uh, the thing that I, I remember how uh, shocked she was. She kept telling me when, uh, after she got the letter, I, I was kind of depressed. I, I was glad she got in, but I knew what was coming. And she didn't, because she'd say, well, I can come home on Wednesday, and we can come home on weekends, and we do this, that, and we'll just slip right through here, this. Well, I knew better. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, she had to work, 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 as you know. Uh, that law school, which people don't realize on the streets, a traumatic experience I get. I'm glad I didn't have to go through with it. But it was for her and everybody else I know. And that bar exam, I did go through that. That was horrible. <laughs> That's the best words you can put on it. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, well, uh, like uh, the spouses of other students, did you go to law school parties and while she was in school? or? Went to one or two uh, parties that uh, we considered musts. Okay. <laughs> you know, professors had had them, and, and we were glad to, I was glad to know the professors. Who were some of her uh, favorite law professors? Well, uh, you'll have to ask her. I, I didn't know them. You know, yeah. one kind of, how are you, ma'am? Yeah. How are you, sir? <laughs> and and I, I stayed away from them, if you want to know the truth. Uh, the dean, uh, I can't recall her name. Was very, Yarbrough. Yarbrough right. was a very. Well, she was awfully good to us. Uh, she would take us to ball games. Uh, couldn't do enough for us. Uh, interested in uh, uh, our welfare. Just a fine, fine person. I remember one time she stopped the situation down there. I was in the in the library studying while Julia was there, okay. so it worked out pretty good. And she walked in and saw me way back in the back, and she said, I told you you couldn't come in here and help my students. What are you doing in here? Of course, everybody was in there just turned and looked. <laughs> and she started laughing, and they realized it was a joke, but at first I thought she was really coming after me. <laughs> fine, fine, fine lady. For those of who, who who are listening who don't know, she was our first minority who was a... That's uh, true. Uh, that's a, that's uh, exactly right. Who was it? Who was yeah. the dean of a yes. law school? And yes. A very fine lady. Yes, she. Yes, she is. I don't know where she is now. Uh, I don't know either. Uh, she didn't stay long enough. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. Uh, well, after surviving three years of her law school, yeah. uh, did she come back up here and uh, join you in the practice? Yes, she did. And uh, man, I tell you what. Uh, don't when you specialize, as you know, you uh, miss out on some some of the bigger, broader questions. And uh, I rem I know here we've had some bad bad cases she's working on herself, 
that she will mention to me, well, what do you think about this? Oh, no, 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 I say, it's not applicable. What are you talking about? That's not applicable. Well, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and <laughs> remembering that question, what about it? Think, well, maybe she's got some. My point is that when you have an opportunity to exchange ideas, the practice of law becomes easier. And I had, for so many years, been used to making my own decisions without talking to anybody. That's not the case now. I have her to sit down and talk to, uh, and bring Steve in. Uh, we're, we're just kind of a mighty mouse little firm. We're all for one and one for all, and we just put it all together. Uh, I don't care whose idea it is, I, don't, I just want to win. And you're the same way. <laughs> um, I understand, uh, and that we didn't mention this uh, earlier, at one point you were the uh, president of the Kingsport Bar Association. Yes, that's when she was in law school. Okay. And I also understand that just recently she was the president of the, yes, of yes, the that, Tennessee yes, Bar Association. That's right. Yes, indeed. So uh, you've got uh, uh, a couple, uh, both of whom have been presidents of the same Bar Association. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not aware of anyone else uh, who's had I, that I opportunity. Haven't, uh, I, I don't know of anybody that, that had that happen to. I thought the Bar was very kind in honoring both of us. Uh, I think it's an important position. Uh, Julia's attendance was extremely high, uh, which is, I guess is a good test, if anything is. And as a matter of fact, I think she has her last meeting come September. Okay. Yeah. How, how, how big is the uh, Kingsport Bar now? How many members do you have? Well, we have about 200 members, but they don't all come. Uh, if you get everybody out, you'll be lucky if you get uh, 60 to 70. As a point of reference, do uh, you know how many members, uh, lawyers, uh, were in Kingsport when you started practicing? Oh, my goodness. I'd say that uh, maybe 30. I think maybe when 30. I, when I started in Knoxville, there were 300, and now they're 1,500. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's just gone out of sight. Uh, are you, uh, what kind of work uh, do you uh, do mostly now, Lacey? Uh, defense work, medical malpractice <coughs> defense work is, is the main load that I carry now and has been getting bigger every year for the last 20 some years. Uh, I get tired of it sometimes, but it's still intriguing. I don't know whether I could even try an automobile case with any degree of success now. Uh, it's, a, it's a field that, as you know, requires a tremendous amount of preparation and more often than not ends up settled, which irritates me sometimes. You know, to have more of these cases tried. And we're going to address that in a moment, too. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, uh, having partners who do a lot of that work, uh, uh, there, there's something, uh, there's more pressure in those kind of cases other than uh, the actual result because, you, as I understand it, and I've seen, uh, you're, you're defending a man's pro professional reputation right. as well. Right. Do, do you, you sense that pressure uh, in, in oh the yeah you of, when you came in you met a friend of mine out in the hallway a physician he had just been applying some of that pressure and uh, it's when you say I have done all I can do my advice is that you do this please take my advice and he says but I can't have this going on what are we going to do to stop it? Well, you're going to have to do this or that, doctor. I can't stop it any other way. Yes. And he's upset. And he's been here several times. You see, you're right. There's a tremendous amount of pressure. 
that uh, builds up on you. And so, you see, doctors now have the right under many policies to tell you whether to settle or not. And you can't if they don't give you that right. And sometimes you're forced into a trial when you know you shouldn't go. And sometimes the company wants to settle when you wish you could go. Very frustrating in the final analysis. You know, you work hard, you've got, you've got the training, you have the ability to go and meet head on down there in front of a jury, and it doesn't happen. Back to uh, uh, you and Julia. Uh, I understand that for years you've been in the horse business, so to speak. Well, yes, sir. You, it's been an expensive business. Yes, sir, you're right. And uh, I think I, it's a, it's a, I wouldn't term it a business. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and that's Tennessee walking horses yes, sir. primarily. And some quarter horses. Uh, how many years have you been uh, working? Uh, has that been your interest? To... Oh, my goodness. I'd say uh, 42 years of marriage. I was interested a little bit before, about uh, 40 years. 40 years. Uh, Julia developed into a first class rider, first class competitor. In fact, she beat the world's grand champion amateur horse in the show down in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we showed everywhere that we could manage to get there. But as time goes by, it becomes more difficult to get out of a car driving all the way to Shelbyville, four and a half to five hours, and getting on a horse and showing them in, comp in competition. And it just got to be a little bit too much for her, and I quit showing about six years ago. Uh, no. Kind of tell us how the walking horse uh, business is, uh, for those who don't know. Well, the walking horse is beloved by those who know the animal. Uh, there's been some criticism about the walking horse, some of the walking horse trainers, as well as every other breed training, thoroughbreds and the rest of them, uh, by the animal rights group. Uh, I hasten to point out that uh, every breed, every trainer in every breed gets criticized because uh, some folks think that uh, you ought to feed them and pat them and, you know, that's all. But a horse is a, is a uh, performance animal. Uh, they uh, give you pleasure whether you're looking at them or riding them. They're an industry. They feed a lot of mouths. And it's just something that you that you grow to love. What's unique about a walking horse? They have a high stepping gait, a head bobbing gait, uh, when they're when they're performing to their utmost. Uh, otherwise, they are the horse that the planter rode back on the plantations. You know, from they have an easy sliding gait. You sit up there and you don't even know they're moving, and the world belongs to you. You know, right. uh, that's the kind that uh, that we like. Although Julia did show in some performance classes, and uh, it is a unique animal. And uh, gosh, uh, you go to a horse show in Middle Tennessee, and you, it is a real industry. You'll see uh, seventy-five trailers parked out there. You know, I'm talking about horse trailers. They all represent money that's being spent by in purchase of the horse, but also uh, in staying at the show. The, these shows love to see the horse people come. They spend money. It's a great part of the economy in the state of Tennessee. I wish I knew what, how many million dollars it, it counts for, but it's there, and I think it's gonna stay there. Did you and Julia have some champions? Yes, we had, we had some, yes, through the years. We had uh, a horse that we, Dearly love Matt Kay's big story. Uh, the people who are old enough, like me, will remember him. If you're not, he's just another horse, you know, like War Admiral or Man of War. He's a great horse then, but yes, we've had some. Julia had a little horse called Final Expression. He had a barn name Sweetness that a groom laid on him, called him Sweetness. Uh, one consistently, and uh, that's the secret. Uh, you know, a football team can beat UT 
maybe once every five years. But if you can go in and beat UT consistently, you're a real football team. And this horse won consistently. And we sold him a couple of three years ago. Went back to see him down in uh, Charles in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Julia rode him again. You know something? Almost brought him home. <laughs> so that's the way they affect you. Are y'all still involved? Uh... Still have one horse. And you'll like this. I bought him from Charlie Terry, who's a fine plaintiff's lawyer down in Marshtown. You know Charlie well. Uh, my clients have paid him a lot of money. Over. Absolutely, and I tell you, he's invested it well in horses. He's got some great horses. Yes, Charlie is a, is a fun to be around. He's, he's just a good guy. I, I practice law against him, and you have too from the very beginning. Right. Yes, I wondered why he was getting all that money. Now I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my clients aren't the only ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Right. Uh, uh, oh, the years, uh, 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 and I guess you've touched upon this briefly. Uh, are there some uh, uh, some lawyers uh, uh, who, well, who you, you thought were uh, some of the best, uh, for whom you had the most respect? Uh, I've got a list here that I made on purpose to. I mean, this is a kind of a, a history, is it not, Neil, to kind of uh, keep it for the posterity? Sure, surely. And I'm not going to refer to a lot of the younger lawyers because they'll they'll come down the road. But I do I do want to mention some of them that I have been particularly impressed with. Uh, and you might, if you have a particular case that you had against them or with them, uh, well, elaborate uh, on that. Uh, I see here on my list my old friend Thad Herndon and his son Chip Herndon. Uh, Chip and I try a lot of malpractice cases together. Uh, Thad, you know, was involved in that uh, case that you, were, I, you and I were in, the highway case. And uh, Thad is, is uh, one of the old timers. I remember trying a case, railroad case against him in front of uh, Judge Taylor down at Greenville Federal Court, and it was a difficult case. We had uh, th two children got knocked off the trestle, killed by the train, and we never could get the train speeding, uh, so we were latching on to almost anything. And, uh, they had a greaser. You know, well, you know what a greaser is or not. It's an instrument on a railroad track that they use to uh, put grease on the car wheels to cut out on the uh, cut down on the wear and tear. We found that about two miles upstream from the bridge, and I thought, boy, this will if we can get that jury believing they greased these wheels. <laughs> so I started talking about the greaser. And uh, Thad kept blocking me pretty well, but I was beginning to get a little bit of it in there, and I got a picture of it in there. And there was a, a, an older gentleman sitting there at the table, and that picture got in. I, the judge let that go in, turned, and he, and he, he absolutely, this is the kind of help that you get sometimes in a lawsuit. He turned and said, if you don't stop him, he'll have that train skidding all the way from Bluff City to Knoxville. <laughs> well, this man talked loud. The jury heard him, the judge heard him, the whole courtroom heard him. But he put into proof things I couldn't get into proof. He, he said exactly what I would like to have said. So <laughs> you get some unusual help along the way, and we've laughed about that through the years that, that you don't expect, you know. And uh, then there's Ben Williamson. You know Ben down at Knoxville. I do. Ben, uh, he'll try you forever. Uh, he's a fellow that I uh, had a case with, with he and Charlie Terry, concrete pumping case, took us to California. Ed Treadway, who's a fine lawyer at Penn Hunter, we were out there together and uh, had a good time. And I never will forget going through Los Angeles in a little uh, putmobile or Volkswagen driven by a blonde-headed court reporter, barefooted, wild as a banshee. 
And I said to myself, no case is worth this. <laughs> when we got there, I said, we'll just call a cab to go back. Thank you, man. But uh, ben, ben will remember that case very well. And uh, you got you got also Johnson City, you got Jim Brading and, uh, over there, and you got Bill Gamble here and Howard Vogel down at Knoxville, who I think is probably the most expert. He's kind of like you. He has a specialty. Yours is cross-examination. Howard Mediation. He's a good mediator. Uh, done splendid work uh, through the years, you know, and uh, a fellow that uh, some of your folks might know, Mr. Bernstein, Knoxville. I think we know her. We uh, know him, I, I'm sorry. Know her and him. <laughs> uh, he has is probably a finer presence as I've ever seen in a lawyer. I, I had one case against him at uh, Bristol, and I tell you what, uh, when I walked in that courtroom, I knew I was up against somebody. And he handled my client, client very gently and me very gently, but he was just a whooping us and a jerking us and <laughs> dragging us around that courtroom. <laughs> People like that, that you've heard about, I've been fortunate in, in having cases against them. They, they, they teach you. you Bob, your own Bob Campbell down there is another one. Pam Reeves, you know Pam. Very well. And uh, uh, Brother Watson, you know him. So uh, it's just been one personality after another, and that's what makes the law go. That's what, that's what uh, makes it happen. You take uh, Dennis Emmon over here, magistrate now, used to be chancellor, good man. Uh, Smith is his uh, clerk, one of the most accommodating people, John Smith, that, that I've ever known. And a fellow that had a lot of influence on me is his daddy, Bill Inman. You know Bill Inman? I do. Uh, Bill, in, Bill is, uh, has done me a, a lot of favors through the years. And I can't go without mentioning, I want to show you this book. Your partner down there is largely responsible for this book called Justice in the Valley. This book is published by, and on behalf of, let me get my glasses on here, of the Historical Society for the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee. And I'm fortunate enough to serve as one of the chairman and your partner John W. Wheeler is the chairman. Uh, this book covers a lot of what has happened in our district court in East Tennessee in my lifetime and in your lifetime. And I, and I recommend it to members of the bar to, to buy and, and go. For instance, we have in here stories of one of my great friends, John Hooker Sr., who prosecuted the labor mogul down at Chattanooga. Hoffa. Hoffa. And uh, John Hooker, the way I know John Hooker, we tried a case involving a, a train and a uh, truck, Mason Dixon truck, down at Martha Crossing near Lebanon, Tennessee. And I was with John in trial down there two weeks, and I guess spent all together uh, a month or two in preparation. Okay. Uh, if you didn't know John, you missed a real personality. Uh, now this is senior, John Hooker Sr. Uh, I never will forget his approach to, to the adversary counsel, Carmack Cochran, who was a fine lawyer too. He stood up and he looked at the jury and said, how many of you know Carmack Cochran? Several hands went up. He said, all right. How many of you know anything good about him? <laughs> Just won him over right there, you know. Won him over like, he, he, his technique was something to, to behold. And he offered me a job. And I've often wondered what would have happened if I had taken him up on it. But uh, he's, one of the real personalities on uh, and part of part of my life 
It really is. One of the best lawyers in the, the history of Tennessee. Oh, yes, yes. And you could call him. He called me one night and he said, I've got a new coat down here and I want you and Red. He called Julia Red. I want, I want you and Red to come down here and see him as soon as you can. I said, well, I'd be happy to, and this, that, done. He died not too long after that. And I've always missed going down to see him. Uh, but let me tell you a story about people and juries. I've always respected juries. I've seen the times when I could shoot them. <laughs> but after I thought about it for a while, I realized that they were right. Jurors want to do the right thing and want to be helpful. <clears throat> I was trying a case down in Rogersville, Tennessee in front of Judge Wilson. And we had a little farm down there and we had a mare that was going to deliver. And Julia was out at the farm. And about halfway through that lawsuit, in came the clerk waving his note. And Julia had called and the mare had had a colt and the colt had rolled underneath the fence away from the mayor, and the mayor was about to go crazy. And Julia says, you got to come. So I said to Judge Wilson right there in open court, I said, I need about a 30-minute intermission here to let me go take care of some private matters. And he said, well, Mr. West, what are they? <laughs> so I told him. He said, well, we've got to do something about that. And the jury stood up almost to a man and woman, I don't know whether there's a woman on there or not, and said, let's go with him and help him. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the way it ought to be. This judge, John Wilson. Yes, John Wilson. Okay. That's the way it ought to be. And, and it turns out that uh, she called, somebody else had gotten the coat back, and we didn't. But uh, things like that get close to your heart. And the plaintiff's attorney, I was defending as usual, the plaintiff's attorney wanted to go too. So I think that's what it's all about. When it's business, it's business, and when it's something else, it's something else. Speaking of judges, uh, who were some of your well, uh, judges you respected the most, uh, or have been? John R. Todd was my favorite. He was an old criminal lawyer. Uh, he liked me. I came back from Nashville when he died to act as an active pallbearer. Uh, I walked into his courtroom one day and he stopped the trial and said, Mr. West, come here. I went up to the bench and he said, I see that you have a case in the morning. I said, yes, sir. I'll be ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> he loved a good fight. But then, we you know, we have Judge Ladd, who is a very learned man, been on the bench for a long time, uh, gives you a good fair trial. Roger Thayer, solid trial lawyer. Uh, we have Johnny McClellan now, uh, whose father, John McClellan Sr., was probably one of the best legal brains and nicest men in the country. Uh, he offered me a job one time, too, and I would have taken it, except it took a lot of travel. And uh, I didn't see about doing He was a labor lawyer. Uh, when you go over to uh, the federal bench, you know, you've got uh, Judge Hull, whom you know, you've tried many cases in front of him. And you have the magistrate there, I've already mentioned. Uh, you get a good trial down there, you get a fair trial down there. Uh, sometimes you don't get a perfect trial, but you're not promised a perfect trial, are you? Uh, you go over to uh, Johnson City and you have people like uh, Jim Brading, uh, he used to be a judge over there. Uh, I just can't fall into the judges in this area. None of them. And I've had some wars with several of them, so, but they always win. Uh, I've heard a story uh, about you uh, concerning a book called the, the Miracle of Compound Interest. You ever heard about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you want to tell us that story? Well, I was trying a very hard lawsuit down at uh, Greenville. Ed Treadway was involved in it, and Bill Hawkins. Was very in. famous big lawsuit. Too. Yes, it is. A, it was a very famous Don lawsuit. Don versus Texas. Absolutely reported everywhere you can find it. 
And I was getting cow tromped. I mean, I was getting stomped and I knew it. And I knew that I had to put a price on that lawsuit somehow or another. So I asked this expert witness who was from Knoxville, who had just ruptured me. I said, uh, The economist, as I understand. Yes. I said, Have you ever read the book, The Miracle of Compound Interest? <laughs> And he looked up, no, I don't believe I have. I said, well, <laughs> you ought to read it sometimes. Now tell us, what is compound interest? And he got to telling me about compound interest. And I said, well, let's assume that you put out $300,000. I was pricing that lawsuit. You know, in the year, how much compound interest would you get and so forth? You went across the street, took it out of the bank and invested it. So that was one of my finer moments. I, uh, I got, got away with it up to a point, but after the case was over and the jury was out, Mr. West, come here. Talk judge about the judge. <laughs> come here. <laughs> he said, is there such a book as Miracle of Compound Interest? <laughs> well, I was caught. <laughs> I said, Judge, uh, not that I know of, but that's not to say that there's not. <laughs> he said, well, he said that last statement gets you off the hook. <laughs> but, yeah, that was, that, that, uh, that was quite an experience. Well, and Bill it. won his case, and he got his money. I heard it was very effective uh, that day. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I see... Uh uh, you've, you've been practicing law, as we said, 50 years. Uh, what, what changes have you seen in the practice? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to use a phrase that uh, I think of many times that was used by Judge Ladd. He's fond of saying, we don't have trial by ambush anymore. <laughs> And that's what it was when you and I first started. You know, all the discovery was not available to us. Uh, I've spent many hours, and I'm sure you have to, riding the back roads, knocking on doors, interviewing witnesses, not knowing who was who really, trying to figure out the plane. I, I've even gone out and looked at cars and gotten their tags at other officer, lawyers' offices and gone and looked them up see who they were. I wanted to know who he was interviewing. And they've done the same to me. So <laughs> that became quite a, a trick in Kingsport in the early days. If you want before trial to know who the lawyer is, he has a tendency to get ready the night before, get all his witnesses there. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get those car tags too late. But to get back to what you're saying. Now, I watched it change now until you, got, you go into mediation, you go into arbitration. Uh, I sit here today and I haven't tried a lawsuit in six months. But I've prepared a lot of them and they all go into mediation or they get settled. And, and that is what I see changing. Now the next question is, is mediation worthwhile? Who's to say? I'm not to say, but I have my own private opinion. Mediation is good up to a point. I will not agree, in my mind, with any process that takes away the party's rights to a trial by jury, if they want it. I think that should be preserved. And I believe, as I've stated before, strongly in the, in the jury system. I don't, has anybody found a better one? See? Uh, more often than not, they're right. So while I endorse mediation up to a point, I still say that more of these cases should be tried. Uh, well, I had, a, I had a lawyer call me the other day and say, Lacey, do you have any General Sessions court cases I can have my boys try for you? 
And I said, hey, are you kidding? <laughs> because he's a competitor, you know. He said, no, he said, I'm trying to illustrate a point. He says, our younger lawyers are not getting any trial training. And they are not. That's why I suggested early on, if you go to law school, come out, go get your job as, as a prosecutor or as a, or a defense man, get in front of that jury and learn. Because we're not going to get it in normal practice. How do you think uh, the professions, uh, where do you think it's heading? Of who? Where do you think our profession is heading in that regard? Oh. Well, I, I think that it's becoming more and more sterile. And and with sterility, usually follows a little bit of dilated or diluted weakness in effectiveness to where uh, the real system that we started out with uh, could be absorbed in the name of, uh, of everybody get along and everybody be peaceful and just don't have any of these problems, just work it all out, save all this trouble. Uh, no. When you do that, in my opinion, you're taking away the bite of the law, and the law has to have some bite. If it doesn't have any bite, it can't protect you. And if we all become mamby-pamby in our approach, yes, let's go down media. I know I don't owe this, but I'm going to pay you. You're going to kill the system, the adversarial system that makes us go. And I've been criticized for being a little bit harsh sometimes in my trial lawsuits. Well, that's what they pay me for. <laughs> that's what they pay me for. You've, uh, you have grandchildren and a, and a great grandchild. Yeah. Would you uh, recommend that they go into the law? Yes, with, with, without any hesitation. But I would point them the way. If you want to do trial work, this is what you need to do to develop. And if you have to stay, you know, on the public roles, that's the price you're going to have to pay. If you want to do corporate work, that's fine. You see, I don't know the corporate work world. I, I'm not, it's foreign to me. But some people, uh, like uh, Sam Bartholomew's firm down in Nashville, he's from Kingsport here, a good friend of mine. His firm does a lot of corporate work. Your firm does a lot of corporate work. That's another field that I can't comment on. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, I'd be bored to death with due respect to all corporate lawyers. I admire them for being able to do it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, but I'd let them know. Now, it's, it's not like it used to be. Uh, Another thing that, you, that, that that's not what, like it used to be, people don't work like they used to. You know that. Uh, it wasn't unusual for me to put in seven days. In fact, I put in six days until I was 65, or five and a half at least. Now, I was interviewing a fellow down at Knoxville and had a bunch of them in, in a, any office that were going to come in. And I talked to him, and when he left, somebody said to him, what are the hours? And he said, he said from can to can't. <laughs> he was the last man I interviewed. You just hear him leaving. <laughs> you see? So a lot of folks don't like to do that anymore. And uh, you take a fellow like Steve Rose, now he, as hard as he works, he's not going to tolerate an associate like that. You won't either. But some of them expect it. They want to practice law like, well, I'm going to get a job at Eastman. Okay? That's not what it's all about. At least not in my world. Speaking of your practice, uh, uh, you're still going full speed. Try to. 
try to. Do you intend to retire or slow no, down? No, sir. When do you intend to ever quit if you do? When the good Lord says, <laughs> you're through. I, I uh, can't see it. I can't see doing it. I don't know what I'd do if I quit. Any regrets? No. No, uh, my friend, it's been a rough trip, and it's been a good trip, and it's been a happy trip. Practice of law is just what I do. Um, uh, when, when you do hang it up, uh, uh, whenever that might be, uh, how would you like to be remembered by your <laughs> your peers or your well, fellow lawyers and, and the public? Too. By my fellow lawyers, uh, well, the public. Let me let me say that the public doesn't. The public gives us a hard time now. It's sad, but it's true. And I want to make this observation. I have sent out checks, and you have too, hundreds of thousands of dollars, along with a little release, and say, please have them sign this release before you cash this check. Honesty, fair dealings between the lawyers. And when they talk about lawyers like they do, I think about that. If, would you think that that Eastman or some Kodak or somebody like that would do that where well, they'd send a team of lawyers along with that check. And I am resentful. And I don't like lawyer jokes. Because I know I know what how much we have to depend on each other's word. And I know that cases are settled between lawyers and later on the plaintiff or one of the parties tries to back out and the court says, no, you settle this case and this is it, as you know. So how would I like to be remembered? Hmm. Somebody else is going to have to decide that, of course. I think I'd like to be remembered as a man of his word. And that's about all I'll have to say about it. Other people are going to remember me as they want to. But that's what I've tried to be. Well, I'm, I personally know that uh, you've succeeded. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, we're about to wind this up. Uh, do you have any comments you'd like to make about the process or your career? Or any individuals or well, that we I, haven't covered? I, I, I've got a lot of individuals I would like to talk about, uh, some of which I have mentioned. Uh, Tommy Rogan down at Knoxville, I mean down at Rogersville, a lovely man, fine lawyer. Uh, Jack Music, he's now dead. He was a good judge over at Johnson City. Uh, Frank Slaughter, you know Frank at Bristol, legend in his own time. Uh, Walter Garland. Oh, I've got to tell you this one story about Walter Garland. <laughs> Walter Gar Garland was a very dignified man and a very good judge. And Bob Green, I know you know Bob Green over at Johnson City, yeah. who can really work on you when he's, when he's, when he's hitting on all fours, you know. Well, we were trying a jury case down in Jonesboro, and Bob had absolutely ruptured me. He had whipped me up one side and down the other in that courtroom. And I had the argument, time for me, and I knew if I was going to save that case, I had to do it then. So I, I put on the show. I was a begging and a pleading and almost down on my knees, you know, trying to convince that jury. And all of a sudden, a woman juror threw her pocketbook straight up in the air and said, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I'm going home. And sure enough, she came out of that jury box, picked up her pocketbook, and out the door she went. Well, that's a hard way to get a mistrial. <laughs> <laughs> but I sure was glad to get that one. <laughs> and Judge Garland, as I said, has always been very formal. 
looked down. He was so shocked. He looked down. He said, "Well, boys, what are we gonna do?" <laughs> so uh, I, I see these names here, and they bring back a lot of a lot of memories that uh, that uh, my career has been full. I've been lucky. I appreciate you all taking the time to talk to me. And I wish you well, as you know. But uh, if you get a chance, sue one of my clients. We'll have another one. <laughs> well, I see you've had a uh, long and distinguished career. Yes, sir. And I thank you. value your friendship on a personal basis. Thank you, sir. I do the same. And we thank you very much for uh, allowing us to interview you. Thank you, sir.